So hi guys, uh, welcome to yet another episode of On the Panel, and uh, we have already had some very nice discussions on camera trapping and night photography, and today uh, we are just going to move on to another dimension of wildlife photography, which is remote shooting. And today I have a very interesting photographer and a very good friend of mine, uh, Graham Purdy, who has done some uh, beautiful work using uh, remote technology and especially remote uh, remote vehicles, you know, those camera buggies. He has done some amazing work uh, using remote buggies and uh, he produced some amazing black and white work which came out in the form of his book called The Eight Feet Book. That's an amazing title as well. So guys, that's uh, Graham uh, on the screen. Graham, how are you doing? Yeah, good, Shivang. It's a little bit different, isn't it, on um, on lockdown? But it's it's nice to be home and uh, good to get some time to chat to yourself. Yeah, same here. Yeah. I and mean, it's tough to be not to be on the field, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's good to stay at home, look at some old images. And I've just been following some. You are still shooting, it seems. You are still going out. <laughs> Well, I'm lucky. I've got I've got a, a fox, uh, urban fox that kind of walks past my apartment every night. So I've been uh, I've been trying to shoot that using some remote cameras. Um, she's got she's got a litter I can see from her underbelly, um, and I think I think it's the hardest subject I've ever photographed. I've got probably probably 1,200 images and none of them are any good. <laughs> so I'm able to do some shooting. I'm also able to get into Richmond Park in London, uh, which is beautiful and we've had some nice weather. So um, no, it's been fine. I, I have no complaints. Um, you know, I can't say it's been, it's been a change of plans, but it's been a, it's been a good time for me. So Graham, um, just moving on to this entire topic of remote photography. Um, you know, we have traveled together and I do, I know that you do quite a bit of uh, long lens photography as well. So it's not that you do not use long lenses. So how was this transition from long lenses to remote shooting? Because your book, which uh, uh, is titled The Eight Feet Book, that is full of uh, wide angle perspectives in black and white. Yeah. So um, why did you uh, just, you know, start shooting wide angle perspectives? Yeah, I, I wanted, um, I, I kind of wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, and I also want to, I, I like intimate shots. Um, I like, um, you know, I, I like getting close to animals. You know, I'm used to that shooting the, the deer here in London. And I, I just know the type of images you can get um, using wide angle versus long lens. Um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily better, but it, it is different. And I kind of like the, I kind of like the challenge of trying to do that uh, in Africa and other places. So I kind of threw myself into it, and um, I started, you know, a number of years ago using monopods and tripods and uh, different techniques. Uh, and then a number of years ago, I kind of upped the ambition level and and bought my first remote control car, and uh, I, you know. <laughs> two or three or four years later, um, I know more about remote control cars than I, than I planned to know. Uh, but the intention was just to get, um, to get more intimate shots. You know, I like bringing across the emotion of the animals. Uh, it's not always about the, the action or the behavior. You know, for me, you know, a beautiful portrait of an animal is, is just as uh, enjoyable than you know, a hunting cheetah or, or something that, along those lines. That's kind of the, the driver behind it really was, was to try and get those up close intimate images. I think, uh, you know, we discussed about this when you were in India, uh, you told me that uh, nowadays a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of this kind of technology is available in the market which people can buy. But uh, in your case, uh, you know, most of the stuff you use, uh, you designed it yourself, right? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, what, uh, what do you suggest? I mean, do uh, should people buy uh, ready, readily available products from the market, or is it something which can be designed uh, at home? I mean, I also use a buggy, but I I just bought bought it off from the market. But uh, you know, we 
uh, there were a lot of audience uh, questions which uh, people asked that uh, when it comes to uh, remote vehicles, can it be designed at home? And if yes, how to design it? Yeah. So I mean, I've got mine here. I can give you a quick look. Yeah. If you're interested. So, so this this is this is mine, um, and it's uh, it's probably yeah. I know because I know some of there's, there's there's a couple of sides to this. So um, if you're cost conscious, building it yourself is significantly cheaper, um, so you could probably make something you know very effective for you know, three or four hundred dollars if, if you wanted. Um, so that's definitely one thing. I mean, my my thought was uh, there were so many unknowns as to uh, what the terrain would be, um, what camera I would use, how much weight, um, you know, where could I use it. That I, I wanted to I wanted to build my own so that um, I was able to make those design decisions. You know, you wouldn't um, you wouldn't choose to design your own long lens. Um, but that's because it's it's been you know, it's been perfected by the experts. Where I think this field is so new that there are some options out there, but um, there's there's quite big limitations with some of the products currently available. So you know you start learning that things that look like flat terrain to these little vehicles are like the Himalayas, uh, and you know whether you've got a very low low center of gravity. It's not going to topple over device, but it won't get over a little bit of grass. So I've gone for something that has suspension. It's got a higher center of gravity, so there's you know pros and cons. So I, I think that you know, to answer the question, you can build your own, but I think you need to be. Um, you don't need to be technical. I'm not. Uh, I'm not an engineer. You know, I. It's it's basic, um, but you do need to learn it because it's new. So learning about the suspension and the electronics of, of these little cars um, is required. It's not difficult, but it's required. So it takes someone, if you're going to build your own, it definitely requires someone with um, a certain degree of drive and uh, motivation. I mean, it's not, it's not easy. You buy a car and you contact the company you buy it from and say, what suspension should I use for a DSLR on top? And they, they just think you're crazy. Um, so they know me well because I'm, I'm the weirdo that puts a car on, on top of these devices. But you widen the suspension, you stiffen the, sorry, you, you widen the axle, you stiffen the suspension. You've got to work out how to attach it. You know, all these little, this little plate here. Um, this little plate, like where do you buy a plate that's 26 centimeters long? Uh, this is just a zip tie. And like, where do you buy aluminium plates? And how thick, half a mil, one and a half, you know, all these things you need to work out. And there's a certain amount of satisfaction in going through that process. But it's not, it's not something you just build in 10 minutes. Um, it's a bit like once you have the car, you put an awful lot of energy into the design and the spec. And you know the pros and cons. I mean, I've upgraded and changed almost everything. Um, so you start to learn. And it's the same when you get into the field and you start to learn how to work around certain species, certain animals, the, the kind of bushcraft with using this device is equally as big a learning curve. So whether you build one, I think if you're building one, you probably have the right mindset to do this type of photography. Uh, if you're buying one and you think you can just get on a plane, go to Africa and start getting amazing shots, then I think you're you're kidding yourself. You know, the, if you do make the the shortcut to getting a device that's already made, you still have a, a very long learning curve and you need to be very patient. And you know, where you go on safari and bring back thousands and thousands of images, you know, you might go out with one of these and only use it four times and you might not get any shots because the horizon's wrong or the animals are, you know, you just get half a head or there, there's, a, there's a, lot of, a lot of learning to be done. Uh, you know, uh, there's another related question, and I guess both of us have received a flurry of questions pertaining to, to ethics uh, when it comes to this form of photography. 
um, you know, I have my own set of opinions pertaining to ethics, but I just wanted to, before presenting my point of view on ethics, I just want to know about from you, uh, what do you think about ethics when it comes to uh, what should Yeah, I mean, um, it's something that people ask me. It's it's something I keep asking myself. Uh, you know, I've been doing this for years now, and um, what I've learned is that if anything I'm doing is not ethical, then I'm doing something that's not going to lead to a good photograph. So almost by the very nature of trying to get these photographs, you have to behave extremely ethically. Um, as I said, there's a, there's a steep learning curve with this type of photography. Uh, it would be a bit like learning to drive your own safari vehicle. You would, you would have someone that shows you what to do. So you do need to be careful. There's, um, there's definitely the opportunity to disturb wildlife. But if you do this type of photography uh, well and, and with the right species at the right time of year, then it can be entirely ethical and possibly even you know, more ethical than, than some of the, the rogue photography that goes on uh, in certain parts of Africa. So, yeah, I think it, it's people see pictures of, uh, of, of buggies zooming around and it, sometimes it's out of context and um, you need to be there and see the, the longer picture. You know, you need to be very patient, very slow. Uh, and while these buggies can move quite fast, they, you need to move them as slow as possible. I've actually changed the engine to a, a slower engine. This is very, very slow, deliberate work. You don't zoom around and chase animals. So I think it's, I think it's a valid question and you could get into all sorts of trouble zooming around with one of these, you know, it, would, it, it could alarm animals, but done in the right way, um, I think it is ethical. The shots, I mean, all the shots I've got, without, without a single exception, the animal is coming to the camera. Now, if the animal's coming to the camera, then it, it's, it's showing curiosity. It's, uh, it's coming for a look. It may decide to walk away, I won't chase it. It may decide <laughs> it wants to attack it like a little lion cub, um, but it comes to you. So you present yourself, you show yourself, and the animal makes a decision. And if they're not interested, or they start to walk away, then you pack up and go home. You don't disturb the animal. So that's that's my thoughts. I mean, what, what's what's your experience with it, or what's your? Response? I think uh, you know when it comes to photographers using this kind of technology, one. Um, you know, buying stuff, readily available stuff from the market is easy. Uh, but immediately deploying it on the field without knowledge of how to uh, use it. I mean, uh, it's very easy to get trained on using the technology. But uh, having proper understanding of animal behavior and uh, uh, how to deploy the you know, vehicle on the field and how to get the animal used to the vehicle. So that is a, you know, that is a learning curve. And for that, you need to have a trained professional with you in the form of you know, your, your naturalist, as well as a person who has already used this kind of a technology. Uh, so, you know, once that team is there together, then, you know, uh, you know together as a team, you know, everyone can work and uh, guide that particular photographer as yeah. to you know how to use that particular buggy in the field. So that I feel is very important. Otherwise, you know, as you mentioned, uh, most of the products that are available in the market, you can just uh, zoom around the vehicle and just uh, um, you know, the the tendency is that okay, we have this device and it should reach that particular subject as soon as possible. You have that yeah. excitement to get the image. And uh, that's where you start breaching that particular line where the animal starts to get spooked. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, whereas... There's one thing that I, I realized that, uh, uh, yeah, I, I made this mistake when I was learning, but in nature, nothing goes straight at another yeah. animal, you know, unless yeah. it's trying to eat it. Um, it's a it's it's a very offensive approach. Yeah. So 
you have to zigzag around. I mean, you have to look like your little car is disinterested and lazy and not a threat. Exactly. And it, it, it's completely different to bringing up a long lens and trying to get the action. It's all about yeah. speed and reactions. This is, this is completely different. I mean, most of the times, uh, in my experience, when, when I have used uh, this kind of stuff, uh, I've just taken it off the vehicle. And even without moving the, the device, the subject, uh, the cats have themselves come closer to the device. Just because it's an external object and it's not moving, but it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of a rock which is not moving, but it doesn't look like a rock, probably. So, uh, even without using the wheels, you, know, you can get the images. And uh, so, and, you know, the cats are very curious about it. So, if they're curious, that means that they're not, they're not getting disturbed. So that's number one, because if they were getting disturbed, they would have just ran up in the bushes. So, mm. um, so, I, uh, so ethics is a very valuable, uh, it's a valid question. And, uh, but it's just that how photographers are treating that subject using technology. So, and if uh, the photographers are getting trained well before using this kind of technology, I feel, uh, you know, training is very important. So, yeah. yeah. So if, if everyone if everyone that visited Africa was given their own safari vehicle, it would be chaos. Exactly. And if if every photographer was given a, a remote control device, it would be chaos. Yeah. And it's it's not for everyone. Not everyone wants to do it, but it, it absolutely must be done with some guidance and supervision. You need right. to be. You need to learn. You know. You don't. You don't do your driving test for a car in a Formula One racing car, and um, so you need to be very slow and build up your knowledge. Start with some easy species. Right. Uh, don't just fire around and go rogue. So yeah, very important. Yeah. There was uh, there were a few more questions uh, which were put up, and I think they were they were uh, quite nice queries. Especially we did a few. Uh, episodes on, uh, there was one episode on DSLR camera trapping uh, earlier. So there were a couple of people who asked me that when it comes to uh, photography, uh, when it comes to DSLR camera trap photography, so what kind of lenses do we use in camera traps vis-a-vis uh, -vis remote shooting and especially, you know, devices like uh, buggies. So um i would say that you know when it, uh, for instance in dslr traps uh, it's dependent on the kind of image we want to produce and you know it's also dependent on the species which we are working on uh, mm -hmm. you know there, it, there are a lot of factors you know it, uh, everything is dependent on the location the trails uh, you know, whether you're, the size of the species is big, if you're working on a small cat or a big cat. Yeah. So the length is the focal length. Uh, it all depends on various scenarios. Whereas uh, in my experience, whenever I've used a, a remote controlled buggy, the wider the focal length, the better it has been for me. You know, things like uh, focal lengths like 14 mm, uh, you know, most of the images which I have used in my book uh, using the buggy, they have been produced with a 14 mm focal length, which just turned out to be you know, quite nice. Uh, more than 14 mm, say, uh, some of the lenses which I used in, in my traps, uh, you know, with that kind of a ground level perspective, it doesn't give a kind of that wide perspective, especially when you're shooting from a close range. Uh, using, using mm. what is your opinion my my view is similar um but my I mean, my favorite lens the one i use most is a 24 mil um my vehicle as you can see is not protected if i was to go wider than 24 um to get a full frame cap would mean that they can easily <laughs> grab my car and I don't want that. They don't want that. It's it's not the plan. So I find 24 is is my favorite focal length. Um, 
I have it, I've, I've also used 35 mil. So with me Alliance, sometimes I've used 35 just because I want a little bit more, a um, little bit more tolerance in the distance between the car and, and, the, and the animal. Um, but 24 is, is my favorite. Um, I think the, the other consideration around um, focal length is, uh, is where you position it on the, on the car itself. So you start, if I put it on my car with anything wider, I'd start to get the car, you know, in shot. Um, but no, I think, I think 24 is kind of, is kind of my go-to. Um, what I've also rigged up is the ability to shoot in portrait at 24, um, which gives a really, really interesting perspective because um, you kind of relatively speaking get, get closer to the animal. So that, that's, what, that's what I've gone for. Um, I certainly wouldn't go longer than 35. Um, I think 24, 20 is probably you know, optimum for me. Okay. So the other aspect which I wanted to discuss about is that uh, when you're shooting remotely, especially using buggies, uh, how, how do you focus, how do you uh, complete mm. controls, how do you do your camera settings? Because yeah, is there in your control, and uh, uh, do you have some kind of a console uh, uh, in your hand, or you know, are you just uh, putting your camera in an auto setting, and uh, uh, you know everything is set on auto, and the camera is taking its own decisions? So how do you manage yeah. these things? Yeah, I mean, we, we talked about building cars or buying cars, um, which is difficult not going to lie but once you start adding cameras and the technical aspects it just gets exponentially um, more questions so there's no one way to do it the way i do it is i don't have a a screen giving me feedback on what my camera is seeing so i have a um the, the way i operate is i put it on live view so he's a mirrorless camera and I can see the back of the screen and the back of the camera. So I don't need to know too much. I just need to know how bad is my horizon? You know, if I had a, if I had a, a, a penny for every, every crooked horizon, I'd retire by now. So is my horizon more or less right? And is the animal more or less where I want it in the frame? So you can see that from 20 meters on the back, even, even that distance. So I can't see what the camera's taking, but I can, in terms of composition, that's how I do composition. Then I set the camera up because you've got a lot of sky and the subject is, is always sort of looking down. It's certainly darker than the sky 99% of the time. I'll overexpose. I'll have it on uh, autofocus, but I'll pick, the, I'll pick a zone where I, where I think the head of the animal is going to be. And grass is not your friend whenever you're doing remote photography. I, I could do three books on perfectly pin sharp grass with uh, different species in the background. Actually, I was thinking of doing some posts on it because they look kind of really arty, but they're complete mistakes. So getting that focal point, relying on camera autofocus, um, I rely on eye auto detect, so I can go for shallow depth of field. I try and keep the ISO um, at 800 as my maximum because Typically with these images, you need to bring up the shadows and bring down the highlights. So you want dynamic range. Once you get to 1600, 3200, um, the image would degrade, but also the dynamic range of the raw file is, is diminished. So I like to go for overcompensation um, about one stop and then, or, or two in, in some cases, 800 ISO autofocus. And I like personally to go for shallow depth of field. I think some people will go for kind of F8, F11 to get everything in focus. Um, but depending on what the animal is, you know, a lot of cats are quite flat, maybe not cheetahs, but their face is, it's not like a fox with a, with a kind of snout. Um, so if, you're on, if your camera's picking up the eye, then you've got most of the face um, with her point of interest, you know, in focus. So that's kind, of, that's kind of how I would do it. And then in terms of firing the shutter, so I drive the car and then, let it sit there. So there's two operations. You don't shoot and drive. So you drive the car and you wait. You maybe maneuver it a little bit. And then I use pocket wizards um, to give me the, the release. 
So you're shooting from a metal object to a device on the ground, quite often with grass. Wet grass is not your friend. So getting that connectivity is, is really difficult. So the cheaper remote devices um, don't tend to work as well. Um, the camera's Wi-Fi, you can forget about it. Uh, that's really only good for about 12 feet. Um, and, and they'll work in perfect situations, you know, perfectly dry inside, you know, in a car park. But when you add moisture, wet grass, line of sight from a metal vehicle, uh, it gets really hard. So I, I use a long range option within Pocket Wizards, which I think they say can give you up to about two miles. Um, but because of the operating environment, I, I only rely on about 40 yards. Uh, so all of these things you need to kind of work out. Um, so whether it's how you fire it, how you compose, how you get a level horizon, what focus approach you're going to take, what exposure approach you're going to take, and also, you know, what kind of picture do you want? So as you said earlier, Shivang, um, you have some control because when you put the device out there, the animal will, has to come to you. You know, you can't chase it, but you can determine where the animal's coming to you. So I'll pick somewhere that's maybe flat, backlit, maybe it's got a tree behind it. You know, I'll pick that stage. You know, I, I won't let the animal just randomly come to me. I'll position my vehicle and the small vehicle. So it's all set up for maximum safety for the camera, but also the right composition and shot. So all those things are the things that you think through. And then I've got about a six or seven point checklist before I deploy the car. So all the different batteries, receivers, kind of, transceivers. Kind of a flow chart. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I've, you know, it, it was probably, I, I tell myself it was the best picture I never got. Um, but I, I, I thought, yeah, oh, I think, oh, the cat came up and I was just snapping away and it was just, Everything was perfect, except that I'd forgotten to turn on the pocket wizard. So I was pressing the button, just thinking, this is, <laughs> this is going to win me. Oh, dear. Anyway, um, you need to be quite diligent. You know, there's a lot of things to set up once you deploy the camera. Um, you know, I, I can't change the settings. And I know on some devices you can. So that works for me, but there's a lot of preparation, as you say, right. a flow chart, a checklist you have to go through. Great. Right. Uh, a lot of people asked me this question uh, that whether this kind of work can be done in India. The answer is that uh, no, we don't uh, get permissions in uh, Indian national parks to uh, you know, deploy remote devices so for shooting. That's the reason why we have to work in um, uh, African locations, and that too, even in Masai Mara, you know, we can't work inside the national park. Uh, yeah. So. That, uh, that's the reason why we, uh, a lot of, uh, even for Grimm and even for me, uh, we have worked in private conferences outside the park. So, so Grimm, uh, uh, you have worked a lot on African species. Uh, so so what's, uh, what's your next project? Uh, where do you go from here? I mean, uh, do you yeah, ever, I'll, I'll... Uh, you want to go beyond African species? And work on other subjects now. Yeah, I, I I do. Um, I I want to go back and spend more time with the bears in Alaska, which is incredible, just amazing. Um, and I'm supposed to be right now. I'm supposed to be in Siberia. Uh, I don't know if you saw. I went there in January yeah. to photograph a moor leopard, um, which I didn't see. <laughs> so I spent a week in a hide looking at trees and snow in minus 25, um, which wasn't really what the plan was. But yeah, I want, I want to try new things. I always think that if I'm organizing a trip, I need to do one trip just to know how I should do it. So I'm supposed to be back in Siberia uh, and I'll bring the right kit and do it in the right way. So I've got Siberia, um, hopefully Alaska at some point. And I think the craziest thing I'm going to do is um, some underwater photography with crocodiles. Yeah. So you swim with them and they're only about three feet away. Right. I, I, don't know how, I don't know how safe it is, but uh, I guess it must be. So there's a few things I'm doing and then I'll be returning to Africa in November. Um, I may try and get there after this lockdown. So 
there's a few things that need to be planned, but I think like everybody else, we're just waiting to see what happens with this virus and if we can travel safely and, and get back to our photography. That's great, Graham. So I'd just like to wish you all the best for all your forthcoming projects. And uh, I hope that with all these forthcoming images, we can see a sequel of your uh, eight feet book once again uh, with yeah. some species. Great. Thanks, Shivang. Hope to see you soon in India. Yeah, same here. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.